we're having a look at the topic of materiality in the audit of financial statements. There are three standards that are involved inside here. Materiality in planning and performing the audit. ISO 450 to consider the materiality of misstatements. And we're also going to consider ISO 600 when we're dealing with group audits and how the group auditor will have to calculate component materiality for the component auditor to do the audit of the component. All right, so let's run through that. Now, the concept of materiality is fundamental to the work of the auditor. We are, auditor here, it says here, is always trying to find material misstatements in the financial statements prepared by management. So we do this as we carry out our audit procedures. Okay. Now, if material misstatements are found, we would normally request management to correct the material misstatements because they are material. Now, if the material misstatements are corrected, that is good. Then the auditor can provide an unqualified opinion. On the other hand, if the material misstatement is not corrected by the client, then the material misstatement remains in the financial statements. In this case, the auditor will provide a qualified opinion or an adverse opinion if it is material and pervasive. Either way, it is good that the material misstatements were found. Therefore, the audit opinion is more likely to be appropriate and audit risk will have been kept at an acceptably low level. On the other hand, the auditor could carry out the audit and there's also the possibility that material misstatements are not found. In this case, the auditor remains unaware that the financial statements are materially misstated because the auditor has not found the material misstatements. Because they're not found, they will not have been corrected. And because the auditor is unaware of the material misstatement, then he is likely to provide an unmodified opinion. And in this case, the opinion is inappropriate because the material misstatements were not found. So what is audit risk? Audit risk is a risk that the auditor expresses an inappropriate opinion when the financial statements are misstated. Now, giving an inappropriate opinion has financial consequences for the auditor, meaning the partner, the audit firm, and the client as well. For the audit firm, there would definitely be financial consequences. There could be lawsuits as a result of issuing the inappropriate opinion because at a future date, the material misstatements that were not found during the audit may have come to light after the auditor's report had been signed and the shareholders might be upset that the auditor was not able to discover them. So the financial consequences here could be lawsuits by the shareholder and of course the ruined reputation as the name of the audit firm is dragged through the media and a potential loss of audit clients as well. Therefore, the aim of the auditor will be to find as many material misstatements as possible during the course of the audit. So what are material misstatements? We're not just talking about misstatements, we're focusing on material misstatements. So there's an accounting definition of materiality. It says that misstatements, including omissions, are considered to be material if they individually or in aggregate could reasonably be expected to influence the economic decision of users which are made on the basis of financial statements. Now, there are a few things inside here that I wish to point out. First of all, misstatements are uncorrected misstatements. Then we've got the word omissions here. Omissions are things that have not been included inside the financial statement. So it could either be things that are included, but they are incorrect and they have not been corrected or omissions that have been left out. They're considered to be material if individually, meaning by themselves, or in aggregate, meaning taken together, could reasonably be expected to influence the economic decision of users taken on the basis of the financial statements. 
Now let's just have a look at this word uses for a bit. This word uses is actually uses as a group. Like for example, a group of shareholders. So let's have a look at this to see what is the meaning of influence the economic decision of users. What kind of misstatement could influence the economic decision of users? So this is the image of a PL and we've got the revenue figure here and the revenue figure here is 2 million. So what kind of misstatement would influence the economic decision of users? So what do you think if revenue is overstated by $2? Meaning that that 2 million here is overstated by $2. The real revenue is therefore $1,999,998. Do you think the shareholders will mind if the financial statements is not corrected for the $2? I really do not think so. So that is what we call immaterial. But let's have a look at another example. So what do you think about this? Do you think that the shareholder will mind if the revenue is overstated by 200,000, meaning that the real revenue is actually 1.8 million? Do you think the shareholders will mind? I think they would. Why? Because the 200,000 is a material amount. That is literally 10% of the published revenue figure of 2 million. So, what we're saying here is that if the shareholder knew that the revenue figure was overstated by 200,000, meaning that 200,000 is missing, I think the shareholders would have voted differently compared to if they had just seen the 200,000. So that is what we mean by influence the economic decision of users. If they had known the real figure, it would have caused them to act differently. It would have caused them to make a different economic decision. So let's see how materiality is considered at the end of the audit. We're talking about ISO 450 here. All right. The auditor's report is actually prepared for the shareholders. In fact, in the audit report, the shareholders are specifically mentioned. But when we refer to the shareholders here, we're talking about the shareholders as a group. The users as a group and not individual shareholders. The auditor's report contains the auditor's opinion. The auditor's opinion provides assurance to the users on the truth and fairness of the financial statements, meaning provide assurance as to whether the financial statements are free from material misstatement. So in coming up with the opinion on the financial statements, the engagement partner has to take into consideration the level of misstatement that is expected to influence the economic decision of users. So here the partner has to consider what amount of the misstatement is considered material, some figure that beyond which the shareholder will actually mind that the figures have not been corrected. So how will the auditor know what this figure is? What kind of figures would be material for the users as a group, the shareholders as a group? So the big question here is what is material? Will the shareholders mind if this misstatement is not found? Well, if they do, then that figure would be considered to be material. Will the shareholders mind if the misstatement is not corrected? If the shareholders mind, then that kind of misstatement is considered to be material. So this is what the definition of materiality was actually referring to. Something would be material if they can reasonably be expected to influence the economic decision of users. So we're looking at whether the shareholders will mind if that misstatement is not found. If a $2 misstatement is not found, of course the shareholders will not mind. But if a 200000 misstatement is not picked up by the auditors and therefore the revenue figure is overstated by 10%, then definitely the shareholders would mind. So how will the audit engagement partner know whether the shareholders would mind or not? The audit partner will not have the ability to go and talk to individual shareholders, so how would he know? 
So in this case, ISA 450 provides you with guidance. ISA 450 has provided us with some kind of rules of thumb that has been used by auditors for ages. So like for example, if the misstatement amounts to more than half percent of revenue, that would be automatically considered to be material. If the misstatement is made up of 5% of the profit before tax, that again would be material. And if the misstatement is more than 1% of total assets, that would be considered to be material. So any kind of misstatement that is more than this amount here would cause the shareholders to mine, and they would probably make a different decision if they knew the truth. So using a practical example here, I've done the calculation for you here based on the rules of thumb. So here is our conclusion. When you're auditing the revenue figure, anything more than 10,000 would be considered to be material. When you're auditing the rest of the PL, anything more than 25,000 would be considered to be material. When you're auditing total assets, whether it's asset or liability, any kind of misstatement that is more than 30,000 would be considered to be material. So what we've done here is considered materiality at the end of the audit using the guidance provided in ISA 450 and we know exactly what is material. So now we are going to go and have a look at materiality at the beginning of the audit. Based on what we know up to now, we know that the shareholders will mind if material misstatements are not found and the financial statements are misstated. So how will the auditor find all these material misstatements. The best way would be to audit all the material transactions and account balances because if the material transactions and account balances are material, then they probably would contain material misstatements as well. So then what are considered to be material transactions and account balances? ISA 320 provides guidance on how to identify material transactions and account balances. Therefore, ISA 320 goes on to say that the auditor will have to first of all calculate a materiality figure for the financial statements as a whole and then calculate something called performance materiality and then calculate another figure which is maturity for specific transactions and balances, and then calculate a maturity for something that is considered to be a clearly trivial threshold. When you're dealing with maturity for the financial statements as a whole, this is at the planning stage, and this is at the performance stage. Then the clearly trivial threshold is whether a material misstatement should be accumulated or not, and we'll deal with that later. So let's just have a look at this again. At the beginning of the audit, we need to find out where the material misstatements are sitting. In order to do that, we're going to find all the material transactions and account balances. So how do we go about calculating this figure for materiality for the financial statements as a whole? Materiality for the financial statements as a whole is also known as overall materiality it can be called preliminary materiality of financial statement materiality and it is a starting point it is a starting point because this would help us to identify which account balances are material so some of the primary purposes for setting the overall materiality is also to make judgment about the size of misstatement that would influence the economic decision of users and whatever that affects the decision of the users would also affect the decision of the engagement partner when he comes up to signing the audit report. Another reason is also to help us to determine performance materiality. The starting figure for performance materiality is materiality for the financial statements as a whole. I'll show you how that works in a bit. And then to also determine what is a clearly trivial threshold. I'll show you how the calculation works. So ISA 320 does not specify a formula or methodology for determining overall materiality, but it does suggest the following. It says that in calculating this figure, the auditor can use benchmarks. And these benchmarks, there are a few. Revenue, 
profit before tax, total assets. The purpose of these benchmarks is just to give the auditor a sense of what is a normal level of activity in the company. The standard goes on to say that when you choose the benchmark, it must be appropriate to the nature of the industry. Like for example, if you're talking about an architect company. So in this situation, it is very unlikely that an architect is going to have a huge amount of total assets. They probably will have software and computers and probably some furniture. But other than that, they probably would not have very much total assets, not like a manufacturing concern. But they would probably have revenue and profit before tax. So if you wanted to calculate materiality, you could use revenue and profit before tax. If you look at a charity, for example, they might have total assets and they probably will have revenue. Well, they don't really have revenue as such. They probably will have donations. But a charity is a not-for-profit organization, so it's very unlikely that they're going to have profit before tax. So... It really depends on what kind of organization you are auditing. But the standard says it must be appropriate if you're going to use the benchmark. It must not be volatile, meaning that the figure should not be going up and down, meaning that the figure should be fairly stable and the figure should not be small. And whatever figures that you're using for revenue and profit before tax, it must be crossed up to 12 months since we're doing this planning maturity at the time of interim audit, which is usually about nine months into the accounting year. So the revenue figure would only be nine months worth. So you will have to gross it up to make it into 12 months. Okay, so these are some points to note about the benchmark. Then the standard also says that we can use percentages. And these are some percentages that are suggested by the standard. Remember, ISO 320 does not specify a formula or a methodology for determining overall materiality. But the standard also goes on to say that whatever figure that you calculate, you have to make sure that you use professional judgment in coming up with the final figure. By the way, when I say final figure, it's not really final final. It is the figure that is established at the interim stage, at the audit planning stage. All right. So this standard says that the maturity level must be client specific. What do you mean by client specific? Like, for example, you will have to take into consideration the figures in the financial statements for that client their own revenue figure, their own PBC figure, and their own total asset figure. Like, for example, this company, they could have a revenue figure of $2 million. Another company might have $10 million. This company might have profit before tax of 500000 Another company might have a different profit before tax. And this company might have total assets of $3 million. Another company might have other figures. So whatever it is, use the figures relating to this particular client. That's one. Professional judgment would also involve you considering the risk assessment for this particular client. So how do you consider risk? A company would be considered to be high risk if let's say this client is a new client or this is a listed client. If that is the case, then we would tend to use the lower end of the percentages so that we can get a lower materiality level. Now, how does that work? So let me just show you a very, very simple example here. Supposing in this company, we had these few transactions, okay, from $110 right up to $2,100. Now, if I had selected a maturity level of 1,500, I only would have audited these two figures, only two transactions, because when the maturity level set at 1,500, we would have only picked up those transactions that are more than or equal to 1,500. But if the maturity level is 300, then we would have picked up more transactions. 300 would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. We would have picked up 7 transactions here. 
So can you see how when the company is more risky, you need to do more auditing. In order to do more auditing, your maturity level has to be brought down. So let's apply this knowledge that we have on how to calculate overall maturity for this particular company here. Apparently, these are the figures and these are the projected figures for 12 months. So now we've got to decide what kind of percentages we want. The standard says these are your choices. They've given you a range here. So it really depends on how risky this particular company is. And maybe this company is not very risky. And therefore, maybe I've chosen it to be 1%. So 1% of 2 million is equal to 20,000. Then I look at the PBT, it is 500,000. And I can choose anything between 5 to 10% and maybe I'll choose 7. This company is not very risky. So that will give me 35,000 here. And the total assets is 3 million and I've chosen it to be 1%. And 1% 1 of 3 million is 30,000. So the auditor can choose any one of these numbers or if he wants to, he can choose something else as well that is similar to that. Anything between twenty to 35000 is really up to him. He has to make professional judgment. So maybe in this particular case, me as the auditor, I've decided that I want to use 35000 as my materiality for the financial statements as a whole. Now, this is only at the planning stage. Therefore, the materiality level is not cast in stone. And this is very important for you to note because as we set it at 35,000, if something new appears in this company that causes the risk to go up or down, that 35,000 can be adjusted up or down as well. So the maturity level has to be revised over the course of the audit. So I have this old AAA question here. So let's have a look. It says at the planning stage, materiality was initially determined to be 900,000. And this was calculated based on the assumption that Jovi Group is a high risk client due to its listed status. During the year, a number of issues arose, which meant that we needed to revise the maturity level for the financial statements as a whole. And the revised maturity is now determined to be 700,000. So they've actually revised it based on the new information. So the exam question actually provided us with an excerpt here of the SOCI here. And let's have a look at this. Gains and property on revaluation, 800,000. Okay. And note three, it says the property revaluation relates to the group's head office. The audit team have not obtained evidence on the revaluation as the gain was immaterial based on the initial calculation of the materiality. But now, is it considered to be material? Yes. Based on the new maturity level, select this item to be audited. So that is how maturity at the overall financial statement level works. We are trying to plan. We're trying to look through the PL, the balance sheet, to see what are the material transactions and account balances and select them. That would give the auditor a very good idea of what needs to be audited, how long the audit is going to take, and how many people we would need to get the job done to meet the deadline. So what we had just done in step one is to consider materiality for the financial statements as a whole. Now we need to consider another level of materiality called performance maturity while you're performing the audit. Now, why do you need to calculate that? Let me explain the rationale. You see, when we do an audit, we're not going to audit 100% of the transaction and balances, right? That's right. So because of that, there is a very real possibility that there might be undetected misstatements. Of course, as an auditor, we will have absolutely no idea what these undetected misstatements are because we have not detected them yet and we don't have a crystal ball and the auditor really will not be able to know. Okay, so what we're worried about is that because we do not audit 100%, there might be smaller misstatements 
inside the transactions and account balances by themselves, not material. As you can actually see here, they're not material compared to 35,000. But when you add them all up together, it is material. So we're very worried that we may not be able to pick up misstatements. And on top of that, there's another problem as well. And that is when we submit the misstatements to the client, there is a possibility that they may not correct all the adjustments that we give. There's a possibility that they might hold some back and say that we do not want to adjust for them this time round. So what we have to do now is using this information, calculate another materiality level in order for us to, to be able to perform the audit. So let's have a look at this a little bit more. Now, performance materiality has to be ascertained using professional judgment. Our starting figure here is 35,000 that we calculated in step one. Then what we're going to do is we're going to reduce this figure for all the undetected misstatements. Of course, if you did not detect it, would you know that it's 19,005? No, you won't because you've not detected it. But we're going to put down a figure. The auditor will have to use his judgment to come up with that. And then less any uncorrected misstatements. The 5,000 here is probably based on his experience with this particular client in the previous year. So once you minus it out, you have got a figure of 10,500 and that's your performance materiality. So in performing the audit, you are going to use that and select all the items that are more than 10,500. Of course, this is very, very tedious. You've got to use professional judgment. Some auditors feel that Performance materiality can be ascertained arbitrarily. Of course, it's a lot more dangerous here, but the starting figure is still 35,000 and they feel that as long as they minus off a certain percentage, they will be fine. Well, that's up to the audit firm to decide for themselves. In that particular case, the performance materiality will then be 17,500. So what are we gonna do with these figures? Um, so for the purposes of this video, I'm just going to use 10,500. So what this means here now is that transaction and balances that are more than the performance materiality of 10,500, the figure that we calculated just now using professional judgment, will be subject to more detailed testing. That is the nature of it, more detailed testing, more substantive testing. It will also require more evidence, meaning that more transactions within that account is going to be tested. Or if you're auditing receivables, there will be more receivable accounts within the balance that would be tested. And the timing of the test would then be a lot more precise as well. Step three is to determine the maturity for very, very specific transactions and balances that the shareholders would be looking out for. This is also a type of performance materiality, for example, on the area of related party transactions, the performance materiality here would be zero. So any related party transactions of more than zero dollars or zero and more than zero would be considered to be material. So for anything where the users of the financial statements are going to be focused, the auditor can select that and that figure would be lower than the normal performance maturity that we saw just now, the 10,500. Then we're looking at another maturity figure, which we call a trivial figure. So let's go through this diagram a bit. So audit procedures have been performed, already performed. Misstatements have been found. Question, is this misstatement trivial? If the answer to that is yes, we ignore it. The answer to that is no, it is not trivial. We're going to include that in the summary of uncorrected misstatements. We're going to accumulate it. So how do you calculate this figure? How do you know what is trivial? Again, we start off with the materiality at the overall financial statement level, which is the 35,000. And we're going to multiply it using anything between 1 to 5%. It would be up to the judgment of the engagement partner or the audit team, right? So anything below that, we're not going to accumulate. 
but if there are other misstatements that are material anything more than 1750 we're going to accumulate so let's say for example there is a legal claim that the client has not made a provision for so we're going to include that inside and let's say the amount here is 10000 so we're going to debit pnl 10000 and we're going to credit provision for legal claim 10000 so anything more than 1750 we're going to accumulate into the summary of uncorrected misstatements okay so that's the end of isa 320 now since we're talking about materiality we might as well talk about component materiality so here we've got a situation where there is a group auditor who is the group auditor the group auditor is the person who is going to be auditing the parent company's financial statements the console adjustments and the consolidated financial statements the only problem here is that the subsidiaries will be audited by component auditors and what we're worried about here is that if the component auditors are doing the audit on their own because the group auditor is not going to go in there and do the audit so the component auditor will have to come up with their own materiality our biggest fear is that their maturity level is too high and if it's too high they may not pick up misstatements material misstatements so if there are material misstatements here 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 when you consolidate it this way then there's inside here there's going to be material misstatements as well and if we are not aware of the material misstatement inside the console. We're going to end up saying that it is true and fair when actually it is not true and fair. So then our audit risk will go up. So what ISA 600 says is that the group auditor will have to calculate component materiality and give it to the component auditor to do the audit of subsidiary one. So how is this figure calculated? We've got this here and you've actually seen this before. So what you have to do here is fill in all the figures for the subsidiary. You've got the percentages. We use professional judgment to decide. And remember, this is the ranges that we have here and come up with the figures here. And that's it. So once you get this, give it to the component auditor. Okay, so let's just have a look at a summary of what we've done so far. At the beginning of the audit, the auditor aims to find as many material misstatements as possible because these can influence the economic decision of users. So now the big question is, what is material? Well, that must be determined and it's called a materiality level. How do we do that? We've got this benchmark and percentages. ISA 320 says materiality for the financial statements as a whole needs to be determined then performance maturity needs to be determined maturity for the specific transaction and balances would have to be determined as well and what is clearly trivial would also have to be determined the standard says the methodology is not specified the auditor will have to come up with their own method and every audit firm has got their own method to derive this figure the auditor has to make sure that he uses judgment and the maturity level needs to be revised as the audit progresses. And at the end of the audit, the auditor must assess the materiality of misstatements that have not been correct and consider the impact on the auditor's opinion. And here we're dealing with ISO 450 and we've got the rules of thumb here to tell the auditor whether it is a material misstatement or not. So we've finished materiality with covered ISA 320, 450 and ISA 600.